Hello, this is Rainer Koschnik from Germany, and I love alternative comics. This episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by Patreon supporters like me. Enjoy the show. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Bill Griffith. And welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, and I'm one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this episode of the interview show, I have the pleasure of talking with Bill Griffith. His new book, Invisible Ink, My Mother's Secret Love Affair with a Famous Cartoonist, is coming out this week from Fantagraphics, and I have a wonderful conversation with Bill. But before we get to that, I want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you'll find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price, and every single month you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials are 45% off cover price. Sometimes they're 50% off, but often the discounts are more impressive than that. And this month is going to be no exception. Among some of the other specials they have, you can find some quite impressive ones from Vertigo. And in fact, they have Vertigo Bundle Number 1, where you can get issue number 1 of Jacked, Red Thorn, Slash and Burn, and Unfollow at 75% off of the cover price. And there is a second Vertigo Bundle special. This one includes all the number two issues of The Twilight Children, Survivor Club, Clean Room, Art Ops, and you'll find that at 50% off of the cover price. So you just can't beat the prices of Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. I uh, went to SPX this past weekend, the Small Press Expo, and I spoke with a variety of creators. The one that I spoke with the longest is Bill Griffith. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I sat down and talked with him in a more intimate setting, away from all of the hubbub and the noise of the convention hall. And he was kind enough to find some time away from the Fantagraphics table to talk with me about the release of his new book, Invisible Ink, as well as a variety of other issues, of course, including Zippy the Pinhead. We have a great talk, and I want to share that with you now. I am extremely pleased to have on the Comics Alternative podcast Bill Griffith, his new book, Invisible Ink, My Mother's Secret Love Affair with a Famous Cartoonist, is coming out, officially released, I guess, this week uh, when this interview will go up. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for being on the show. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I don't want to come across at the beginning as a fawning fan, but I do have to say that you're one of my comics heroes, and so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Well, gosh, thank you so much. Yes. So, so that's the fan part of me, okay. and I got that out of the way. But let's talk about the more interesting, critical side of what we do on the podcast. Invisible Ink is a very different kind of work from from what we've seen from you. Uh, for For our listeners who are familiar with your past work, and specifically Zippy, um, how is Invisible Ink different? Well, um, this is my first graphic. I don't uh, use the word novel because it's not fiction. It's a graphic memoir. It's my first long, long-form narrative ever. Uh, 
before I did the Zippy Daily Strip, back in my underground days in the 70s, I did a lot of long stories, but nothing anywhere near as ambitious as this. And I felt I was kind of reconnecting to that part of me that went from underground stuff doing 10, 12, 14-page stories in various comics and magazines. Then I spent, you know, close to 30 years doing a daily strip. And I feel like I'm making full circle back to doing longer pieces with this, even though this is much longer and much more ambitious than anything I did back in the 70s. But it's... um, it's a memoir in the sense that it's all true, and it's a story that kind of, it, be, it had its beginnings in underground comics, actually. In 1974, um, some of your listeners may remember one of my more commercially successful underground titles, a comic book series called Young Lust Comics. <laughs> they originally were parodies of girls' romance comics, and of course they went all the way. That was the the pledge to the reader Um, so there's lots of sex and Young Lust number 4 1974 at that point Young Lust got a little less parody and a little more I don't know probing and psychological and I did a story in which I delineated six love affairs one page per love affair and one of them was a middle-aged housewife and a famous cartoonist. It lasted one page, and I remember at the time being worried that my mother might see it and ask me, is that me? Because she had told me. As your listeners will see when they read my book, she had confessed of a long-term love affair with a then very famous cartoonist in 1972, right after my father died. So this was two years after that. And I made the first stab, in effect, at this material. But from 1974 until three years ago, (laughs) it just sat quiet until I finally, through various triggered devices, including a visit to my uncle, who's my um, mother's brother and still alive, um, and me deciding to finally go into the basement and look at all the boxes of papers that she had left when she died. And when those two events happened, the book was born, (laughs) because I suddenly had all this material. My mother never told me in any detail about this affair in person. But when she died, she pointed to a a, a filing cabinet in her living room. She said, throw everything away but that, save that. So I picked that up and transported it to Connecticut where I moved, And it sat in my basement, five or six years, until I finally looked at it. And there were diaries, an unfinished, thinly disguised novel about all this information. And suddenly I was propelled into doing the book. So the beginnings uh, are from that issue of Young Lust, where you create this one page story, but mask it. Yes. Um, yes, the people, they were given different names in that story. Yeah. Um, did you have any desire in any way, in any form, uh, until, let's say, a few years ago, to turn this, to develop it into a longer work, memoir or otherwise, or was this visit to, let's say, your Israel and Corral, out, yeah. right, down no, in it, North Carolina? Yeah, no, I, I, it was a dormant thought. I had it clearly somewhere in the back of my mind. For all those years, from 74 until three years ago. But it never pushed itself to the front of my mind to the point where I even took any notes. When I visited my uncle, um, this is my mother died in 1998, so she's been dead for quite a while. When I visited my uncle, conversation one night got around to my mother, and he asked, actually it was his wife, my aunt, who asked, did I think my mother ever had an affair with so-and-so, a certain person. And I said, I don't think so, because that was our neighbor. I don't think she would have been that risky. But of course, you've heard about Lawrence Larrier, who, with whom she had a 16-year affair, and they both, they said, who? Lawrence who? And I told them. Their reaction, instead of being judgmental, which I would have expected, their reaction was, in fact, my aunt said, oh, good for her. 
<laughs> I know she was not happy with your father. And I said, yes. Um, I was kind of taken aback. Here's this, um, I wouldn't call her a fundamentalist, but a seriously religious Baptist Southern lady saying good for you about my mother having an affair. So that night, I just, the book was literally born that night. I, I thought, here, here it is. I've kind of thought somewhere in my mind, I'm going to do a graphic novel. It's taken me an awful long time. Here it is. It's been just handed to me. The story of my mother's affair. I went online that night and found a, a huge amount of information and images about this man that she had the affair with, Lawrence Larrier, who is today completely forgotten. I just gave a talk here, a whole bunch of people, and I asked, has anybody ever heard of Lawrence Larrier? Not one person. And these are comics people. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of him? No, and in fact, I had not heard of Larrier until I read Invisible Ink. Okay. Well, the one thing you may have seen without quite knowing if he was responsible for it, every year from 1941 to 1971, he put out a book, a book called Best Cartoons of the Year. Mm -hmm. Gag cartoons. That was his bread and butter every year. He did millions of other things. This guy was a workaholic to the extreme. But he did these, these anthologies. And when sometimes I say to people, have you ever heard of him? They say no. And then I say, well, did you ever see Best Cartoons of the Year? And, oh, that, yeah. I remember that was in my house when I was a kid or whatever. So, yeah, he is forgotten. He's, he's literally forgotten. But this is a man who... His, he started doing comics in the early 1920s for, you know, college humor magazines. He did four daily comic strips, all of which failed. One of them lasted four years before it failed. He wrote 16 crime novels. He's a great crime novel writer. A much better crime novel writer than a cartoonist. Um, thousands upon thousands of gags. And he's completely forgotten. So maybe I'll be reviving his some sort of interest in his career. But don't expect anything earth-shaking. He was a, what shall we say, he was a crowd pleaser. <laughs> he was not, he was, personally, he was a thoughtful, intellectual man. His comics are all obvious lowbrow gag comics. He would never have been accepted in the New Yorker, for instance. <laughs> More like, you know, Hooey magazine and Clown magazine. Hundreds of magazines that printed gag cartoons that are all totally forgotten. He worked for all of them. He was an obsessive. Now, when you were younger, and you write about this, you, you met him. I mean, you knew him. I only met him once, but all of the influence that came into my life through him was always around the house, but I had no idea that he was the reason. When my mother first met him, as smart as my mother was, she had very little interest in art. He opened the whole art world up to her. They would go to museums, galleries. They would go to Broadway shows. They would go to Greenwich Village nightclubs. This was a, you know, a liberal, intellectual New York guy. And all of the stuff that she was exposed to as a result would filter into my living room. I wouldn't say to my mother, hey, how come there's a Picasso book on the coffee table? I would just pick it up and look at it and be fascinated. So she brought, through him, she brought this cultured world into our house. My father had zero interest in art. He was a smart guy, but comics, art, music, no interest. And he didn't wonder why all of a sudden yeah. certain books were brought in. Well, you know, okay. As far my as you knew. My father was a very buttoned up guy. Repressed, you might say. But how could he not have known? This is an affair that went on for 16 years. In my mother's diary, she says, the longest we were ever apart was four weeks. So that means for 16 years, once Twice, every week or two, she was going into New York. Ostensibly, she was his secretary, sort of. Private and part-time. She answered an ad in a newspaper. That's how she got connected to him. 
she worked mostly on his crime novels. She was a writer herself, and she was a strict grammarian. She was the editor for his crime novels, in fact. She corrected his syntax and his spelling. My father objected to this job at first out of some sense of ego. Or, you know, um, and I remember at one point, I remember him yelling, if you're going to do this, get paid in cash. <laughs> so, and he called, he called Larrier Mr. Larrier. He would never call years. him by his first name. They would always say, Mr. La- did Mr. Larrier pay you today, Barbara? Um, so she conducted this affair in the 1950s and 60s, throughout the early 70s, in complete secret. But did my father know? All I can say is, how could he not have known? Mm-hmm. My father died in 1972, so I never got to ask her. Uh, when I asked my sister about this, she said, of course he knew. And I say, well, do you know for sure? And she said, no, I just, how could he not? So he knew, and yet, you know, I mean, some marriages have that contract, you know? Um, okay, you, you have an affair, but I'll look the other way, and we will not get divorced. This will not lead to an end of our marriage. In her novel, in her graph, in her, sorry, her diary, she does talk about having a mechanical relationship with my father, both sexual and every other way. When I once asked her, sometime in the 90s, when she lived in San Francisco, where I lived, I said, were you and dad ever happy? And she said, yes, we had about four years. The first four years, and that was it. After that, it was... He was, I have to kind of blame him mostly, but you can't blame anybody really, but he became some other guy. And in the first four years, he was a very easygoing, um, optimistic guy, but he had a career as an army officer, and I, I just can't help but think that was a very unhappy career for him. And he probably transferred that unhappiness to his marriage and my mother sought happiness elsewhere now I'm wondering how discovering all of this knowledge or I guess revisiting along with that all of this knowledge and the creation of Invisible Ink how that may have been different experiences because how old were you when you first found out that she had this affair with Larry uh, my mother when my father died, he died of a he died in a bicycle accident of all things in 1972, and he was in a coma. And I was living in San Francisco. I flew to I flew to New York, and we were living in Levittown. My mother was, and we all went to the hospital. And within a day or two, he died. My mother, I know, I'm just my sister and I are just in shock in the waiting room. And my mother turned to me within a few minutes and she said, I want to tell you something now because I won't be able to tell you later. I had a long, happy affair with a man you knew slightly. And she named him. And I remember just hardly being able to take in that information. Just because of the death of your, fa- your father? My so- father died 15 yeah. minutes. He was just, we were still in the waiting room just in shock. I, I didn't say anything. I don't. Th- I just looked at her. Um, my sister, same. Nothing. Then, it wasn't until she died that I knew the full story. When I when the affair began in 1957, I was 13. I had, of course, I had no idea. I had. I was still in. I started, I was always a, a kid very interested in comics, but about the age of 14, I shifted over to fine art. So at 13, I was still very interested in comics, and she would bring home his books, his best cartoons of the year books, um, all kinds of things that he did. He was, he was an editor as well as a cartoonist. And I would see them, and I, so I knew who he was. Um, he, he was famous, but not a household word, but he was... 
everywhere. His art would be recognizable from His art people at the time. Very recognizable. He had a very distinct style. And like I say, he was an editor and he was a, a writer. He was a fiction writer, crime, crime fiction. So these books would come into the house. All of a sudden, there would be, there would be these 35 cent pocketbooks. You know, The Day I Died was one of his titles. You know, they were all very lurid. Um, Hard boil, hard boiled, Raymond Chandler esque, just the, exactly the kind of crime fiction that I like, mm-hmm. and at the time, liked. And I remember thinking I liked his writing actually better than his cartooning. Even at that early age, I could sense that there was something a little bit hack mm-hmm. about his comics, but and there was something hack about his writing too. But his writing was so much more satisfying. Yeah, and. So yes, I um, I lived with a kind of I like to think of him as almost like a shadow father, and I always wondered um, later, much later, well, what would have happened if my mother, in the normal course of events that happens to many marriages, if she and my father had divorced, and Larry and his wife had divorced, and my mother and Larry had married, <laughs> what would that have done to me? And I address that in the book. Yeah, there's one section in particular that I appreciate that you speculate on what might have happened to your style. Yes. Especially... Not just my style, my content. Exactly. Uh, Given uh, Larrier's peanut method. Yes. Larrier Larrier wrote three best-selling how-to-draw cartoon books. Um, One of them was sort of a pamphlet, but it went into many, many printings. And that was where the peanut method was described, which he used in all of his... How to draw a cartoon? Now, explain the peanut method. Right. He said every form can be reduced to a peanut shape. <laughs> um, it's it's both true and ridiculous at the same time. It doesn't really help unless you want to draw literally a peanut shaped person. You know, he shows you how to use the peanut as the basic anatom- anatomical structure for all human beings and all animals. And when you look at it, it seems very logical. But when you apply it, it's really not very helpful. But this is a guy who had not only these how-to-draw cartoon books, which wound up in my house, but he had, and this I didn't know about, he had a cartooning school. Well, you know, it was a, it was a mail-order business, but it had an office. It had a dozen cartoonists that worked for him. It was a little bit like the how to draw, you know, you, you, you can be an artist matchbook cover drawings, you know, where you, you send in for an aptitude test mm-hmm. and, of course, everybody gets accepted. And, and you think Norman Rockwell is going to, you know, mentor my, my comic, <laughs> my, my illustration. But Larry did. I came across people who he had, through the mails, spent a huge amount of time writing to them criticizing their work he he didn't give it to other people to do he can I don't know how long this thing has lasted about five years it must have been an exhausting on top of all the other stuff he was doing to receive this amateur stuff and write careful criticisms of it but he did he mentored people at his in his house I found out way after my mother and his relationship ended there are several people who have um, on Facebook who have told me that um, these were Freeport, Long Island where he lived became largely a poor black community towards the end of his time there and his reaction to that being a big liberal guy was not to leave but to invite poor black kids into his house and talk to them and some of them said hey what's it like to be a cartoonist and he said well why don't we try it this, this guy, you know, he was an amazing guy. Um, so if he had been my real father through divorce, of course he would have pushed me <laughs> into his kind of comics. Um, and we'd have a Griffey that looks much different than the Griffey yes. we're used to. Yeah, well, like I've said before, I mean, I'm reviving this man's career to some degree. But when people examine it, they're not going to find a lot of ins- inspired work. Mm-hmm. You might find some good stuff here and there. His daily strips are interesting. Only one of them did he draw. 
he drew one and he wrote three others. Um, he worked with a lot of artists you know, that, were, that did, did, art, did art that he did the writing for. But his, his method of cartooning was very specific, not terribly different from other cartoon instruction booklets, but had I gone the route that he might have put me on at an early age, let's say 14, when I was still s subjected to, to being formed by somebody, if this had happened later, it wouldn't have affected me. But at 14, 15, um, I probably would have forsaken Picasso, <laughs> where I was heading, and Van Gogh and the whole fine art world, and I would have stayed with comics. And maybe this is what would have happened. Yeah. And there's, this, there's a section of the book where you even do speculate over several pages how your career may have been a lot different. So instead of writing it, for the underground, if you I had, for... I have a section in here where I wonder, okay, first of all, okay, uh, I went to art school in 1962, college. I went to Pratt Institute. I had applied to the School of Visual Arts, which where I incidentally teach now, one, one day a week. Um, the School of Visual Arts in 1962 was a non-degree giving institution. Mm -hmm. So my parents said, you can't go there. You, we're not going to pay for your tuition and not get a degree. So you have to go to Pratt. You can't. I wanted to go to the School of Visual Arts. The School of Visual Arts at that time and before was, it was founded as a cartooning school by Bern Hogarth, who did Tarzan. Mm -hmm. okay? um, I speculate, had I gone to the School of Visual Arts and not Pratt and stayed in New York and not gone to San Francisco to join the underground comics scene, what would my stuff have been like? And I imagine in the, in the 60s there were all these sleazy uh, gag men's magazines, all of, whom, uh, all of which Larry worked for. Would I have submitted work to them and would I have looked askance at the underground comics that I might come across? <laughs> and I have a scene where I'm looking at an issue of Zap, this this alternative version of myself. You know, I'm saying, you know, this guy Crumb. You know, what's it's it's the artwork isn't bad, but it's totally obscene. This guy will never have a career in the industry, <laughs> <laughs> which I imagine Larry would have thought too. Yeah. yeah, and also your Mr. Mr. Toad. Right. I imagine. Okay, what if Mr. Toad? who was percolating in my brain even in the late 50s. What if he had been uh, larrierized? <laughs> um, and so I have a, I, have a I, call, I just call him the, uh, Mr. Frog, and he's just a gag character. He just does wacky things. Not the kind of disturbing figure that we know. No, and then I hint at who he really is. It's also later in the book. It was pointed out to me through several dreams in the early 70s that I had that Mr. Toad was an incarnation of my father. He was like a disciplinarian, author uh, authoritarian figure. Now, you know, let me ask you about that because, you know, having read the Zippy Strips for years and, you know, knowing the Mr. Toad character and how nefarious he was, I wasn't aware in any way that Mr. Toad may have been linked to your familial background. But... Is this kind of a coming out of that information for you in this book? Um, yes and no, because when I had one of my early dreams where Mr. Toad appeared, I, I was doing the weekly Zippy strip at that time. This was in the mid to late 70s. So I did a strip in which I recount the dream. In the dream, I come home. And Mr. Toad is waiting at the front door with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I recounted that dream, and I hinted that Mr. Toad may indeed be some sort of, you know, um, scary father figure. And, but that was just a one-shot thing. And, it, yeah, in effect, here I go into a little more deeply. There's also a scene later in the book where um, Mr. Toad actually appears to me when I'm sitting at the kitchen table and um, here I, the, the book is broken up eight or ten times by being yanked back into the present the book mostly takes place in the past of course because it's about this affair which went from 1957 to 1972 
but every once in a while, you come back to the present, and I'm talking to my wife, mm-hmm. cartoonist Diane Newman, and we're talking about the material. And at one point, um, she says, um, well, I ask her, I say, who am I kidding? I would never have been like Larry. I, I'm too, uh, I would have resisted any kind of attempt to make me into that kind of a cartoonist. And uh, Diane says, yeah, you were too much of the class clown to take Larry seriously. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Toad enters, kind of a shadowy figure. <laughs> and I say, right, like my Mr. the Toad character, no amount of funny animal gag writing could keep him from tormenting me. And Diane says, he's in your head, always lurking. And then he appears to me, and he's, he's laughing at me, and I say, not now, Mr. Toad. And then Diane says, Bill, who are you talking to? <laughs> and then Mr. Toad starts his... He's a tormentor. He's a tormenting figure. He starts to torment me. And he tells me he knows who he is. He's my father. And Diane says, don't goad the toad. And <laughs> which, which I, I got that from a, uh, a fan, by the way. Someone, oh, really? Someone, that wasn't someone, yours? Someone sent me that line years ago. I must have used it a hundred times. Yeah. Um, anyway... So I say, um, okay, if, if, if we're not here to talk about Larry or I'm talking to Mr. Toad, um, and, and let, let's talk about Larry, or, and Mr. Toad says, never heard of the man. And then I go into this reverie where I close my eyes and I go into a dream. So Mr. Mr. Toad, as a kind of shadowy father figure, introduces this long dream sequence in the book where I recount a 10 year period of dreams this is all real where I used to dream about my father he first appeared at a great distance always in the dreams no contact so you actually had these dreams all real yes over a period of 10 years every few months sometimes separated by even a year um, in my dreams my father would Come literally physically closer to me in the dreams. First, he would appear as just a figure in a bus that would go by, and I'd see his face in the window, and, it's, and I think, is, it, is that my father? Um, I'm sure other people have, have had dreams like this. We often dream of people who died, mm-hmm. and it's almost like they, they're coming back to us and saying, "No, I didn't die. I, I'm still here." Those dreams progress to where. Then I would see him on the sidewalk. Then I, so all of a sudden he's in a restaurant, and he starts speaking, and then we start talking. And this is all true, all the dreams. I, was, I wanted to bring my father into the book, since I couldn't bring him into the book speaking for himself, because he left, he left me some letters, but he didn't leave me any material that would relate to this material, this, this affair. So I have no, I, I have nothing to look at. But I wanted to bring him into the story and give him some life. And not just because he was my father, but because he's an important character in the book. Mm-hmm. At the end of the book, he comes in very strongly when I discover something I'd never discovered all during writing of the book which were a box of letters that he wrote when he and my mother were just married. And suddenly there's my father, the nice guy, when they were happy. And you discover this when you go back another time to visit your uncle, the Al, book, right? Right after your The book, died. yes. The book is, is uh, this is strictly serendipitous, but the book starts because I visit my uncle and tell him about Larrier, and then I have this flood of images and material, and I start to put the book together. As I'm finishing the book, I'm thinking, okay, how am I going to end this book? There are any number of ways I could end this book. Literally, while I'm thinking that, I get a phone call, and my uncle says, Nell died, my aunt, his wife. I knew she was very, very ill. I knew she was, she was dying. Okay, I knew, I knew this was going to happen sometime. And so I go down for the funeral. And after the funeral, I stay for a few days and hang out with my uncle. And while we're talking, I look above where we are, 
he was he was a he's a ham radio operator my uncle <laughs> he still is on the ham radio with these 1950s tubes and um, big antenna on his roof speaking all in Morse code and how old is he now? 91 91 yes 91 he, had, he retains every marble this guy is completely <laughs> compass mentis okay so we're talking in his ham radio room it's kind of his den it's the one room where his, his wife's presence is not felt every, the rest of the place was completely his wife's house in his den, it's all him. Up in a closet behind him where we're talking, which I guess was never opened before on my visits, I say, what are those boxes? They look like letter, old boxes of letters. And he said, oh yeah, my father left them to me. I've never opened them. I said, well, do you mind if I look through them? And in one of them, there were letters to Al, my uncle, from my mother and father, both before they were married and in the early years, including my birth. You know, are you going to come up? This was all in the war years, 1940s. Um, my father had joined the Army the day after Pearl Harbor. He volunteered for the Army the day after Pearl Harbor. My uncle was drafted two years later. So my father is writing these, these very friendly open, helpful, affectionate letters to my Uncle Al about Army life, giving him clues as to how to deal with officers and assignments and offering, you know, to send him five dollars and let's get together. My father was stationed in North Carolina at the time. Al was stationed in, he was in Atlantic City, New Jersey, learning how to be a radio operator for the, for the Army. That's where he got into ham radio. They got together a few times. My mother wrote to him. And my father, a voice that I never heard before, ever, spoke to me from these letters. So I end the book on that note with my father um, speaking and my mother speaking about their marriage when they were happy. And it was a perfect ending. Because ultimately what this book is about, it's not really the affair, it's about a marriage. At, at the very core of the book, that's what it's about. It's about America. In fact, that's one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you about. I mean, one would think from reading the subtitle, My Mother's Secret Love Affair with a Famous Cartoonist, that that's what this story would be about. But I felt that there was a lot more going on, even at the very beginning. When, when we first get to your story, we're introduced to your entire family and yeah. what that experience right. has meant to you. Right. So, for instance, we're introduced to William Henry Jackson. You're named after him. That's right. Uh, and your and your family's background with like, living in that shadow. And then that becomes a springboard into information about your mother and then your father. So this is yeah. this is a larger family memoir. Yes. Yeah. It's just, it, yes, it's... It's the story of a family, um, and it's the story of a marriage, and it's the story of an affair, in that order, probably. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started doing comics, my mother was very proud of it. She was very supportive. My father, just before he died, began to respect what I was doing, mostly because I was making a living. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever read any of it. He actually saw a copy of Young Lust Number no. 1 in Penn Station in a newsstand and wrote to me in San Francisco how proud he was to see that. Really? So you didn't He, you he didn't did not pick him? it up. He did not pick it up and buy it. Mm -hmm. He just saw my name on the cover. Wow. So he was coming around in his own conservative repressed way. He was coming around to to dealing with what I did and, you know, had he lived we might have had a decent relationship. It was just beginning to thaw when he died. Well, you make it a point of mentioning that right before he died, the two of you were becoming closer in ways yeah. that you hadn't been before. Absolutely. Which yeah. adds to part of the tragedy of his death. Absolutely. Um, in the two years before he died, I have all, I've saved all of his letters. If I read those letters, once again, this is, this is not the guy that I knew as a kid. The guy that I knew as a kid was an unhappy, angry man who physically abused my sister and myself mostly my sister never sexually but 
he beat my sister to a pulp. He, he smacked me around. I, in the book, I deal with it. I, I can't not mention it. It's, a, it's a, a fact of our family's life. When I was 11 years old, for whatever reason, I hit him back. I hit him in the arm with, with my fist. Mm-hmm. He looked... He looked like he had seen a ghost. He, was, he went white. That was the last time he hit me. He would still be angry with me. He would still yell at me. We would have terrible arguments. But he stopped, stopped hitting me. Um, but there was another guy before that and, I, and after that. There was another guy. I think what he was doing when he was attacking my sister he was lashing out at my mother Mm -hmm. and he never hit her they would have horrible arguments but he never laid a hand on my mother ever I asked her once just to be sure she said no dad never hit me my sister my mother and I had therapy sessions together in the early 1990s to talk about all this which were very helpful for everybody. And this is 20 years after his passing? Yes. Yes. Um, As I've said a few times before, my sister and I have different impressions of our mother. Mm -hmm. And it's in the book. Um, When my father was wailing on my sister in her bedroom, I was in my bedroom upstairs. This is in Levittown. Long Island and I would hear it and I would put a pillow over my head so I couldn't hear it this is all in the book (laughs) my mother 10 feet away from the from the the abuse happening instead of coming to my sister's defense she went into the garage and sat in the car with the windows rolled up until it was over as you can imagine this did not make for much of a good relationship between my mother and my sister in later years, or then either. She didn't protect her, her daughter. So the therapy that came 20 years later... The therapy was, was getting mess- all this yes. out, yes. And it was very, very difficult for my mother and my sister. I did some of it with them, and they did a bunch of it together, and they did it, my mother did a bunch of it separately. I was very lucky enough starting from the early 80s to have found a really wonderful therapist who I used to talk to every once in a while. And that was him. That was this guy. And um, I can't say it was completely a healing thing because it was really opening up a lot of wounds more than it was healing. But it was talking about stuff that had to be talked about. And it was done gratefully, I think, gratefully for everybody's sake, before my mother died. So Nancy, my sister, got a lot of stuff out. Uh, My mother was devastated by a lot of it, had a very hard time with it, but gradually took responsibility. Now, I I hesitate to ask this question because I always think that sometimes it's too convenient to see works of art as therapy for the artist. But was there something therapeutic about getting this out you know you knew the information but putting it into comics form in this graphic memoir I I don't think I don't think that's the right word to use Um, cathartic is more like it cathartic more than therapeutic the catharsis was a uh, like a rolling catharsis during the making of this book about I don't know every so often probably depending on what I was drawing. It was always during the act of drawing, not the act of writing. Um, I would break down on my drawing table and just start crying. And um, at first it was very scary to me that that happened. I'm not someone who does that very often. It has happened. Um, But it happened half a dozen times during the writing of the book and when that happened I would feel that my mother was right there in the room and she was neither approving or disapproving of what I was doing 
but she was there, palpably there next to me. There's one point in the book where I talk about a dream, right in the middle of doing this book, where I had a dream that my mother was in a sleeping bag, sound asleep on my drawing table Mm -hmm. when I came down to work. And I come down and I see her, and I kind of tap her on the shoulder, and she wakes up and she says... Well, that was very refreshing. And she gets up and she says, now get back to work. That was the one time I felt that my mother was kind of putting a little seal of approval on what Mm -hmm. I was doing. I want to say one more thing um, about that. This this is very, about two weeks ago, I was thinking, okay, my mother wrote a 384-page novel that was never published. She had an agent. She tried to get it published. Never published. I... In the next few weeks, I'm going to go on to Create Space on Amazon, and I'm going to make that novel available. Really? Yes. It's, it'll be, you know, on demand, whoever wants to buy it. Maybe not a lot of people, but some. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I thought of that, I had another <laughs> cathartic moment. I didn't break down crying, but I, it was like, there she is saying to me, okay, Bill, you did this, but now do something for me. There's this thing called Create Space on Amazon. <laughs> I'm up in heaven, and I can see it down. And I want you to go there and make this book available, mm-hmm. which is I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it as a facsimile from the type, typeset pages, oh, typewritten okay. pages. And I'm gonna, I'll do a little cover, but it'll be all her. So. You know, I'm reminded of something that you listed in that presentation you gave on the top 40 list of, of comics. Uh, one of the, one of the earlier, uh, I guess, suggestions or observations is, I guess, it's in two parts, if I remember correctly. That, you know, within the context of Freud, every creation, every everyone you depict is you. Yes. Well, Freud said everybody you dream is you. Um, and then the second part of that is that not all autobiographic comics are. Autobiography is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yes. Sometimes you, you tell it through a mask or uh, an actor that you that you filter yourself through. Um, sometimes you sometimes you're doing a comic and you don't realize that's what you're doing. I I did a strip in 1980 called Cast of Characters, in which I imagine a future, which would be kind of about now, mm-hmm. when all the underground cartoonists are living in a retirement home. <laughs> so there's Spain and Crumb and Gilbert Shelton and everybody, all, all of my compatriots from the underground days. And, you know, they're kind of shuffling along with walkers and talking about the old days. And there's a sequence where Art Spiegelman and I are trying to get them all to start working on a new comic book, you know, because we, we can't help ourselves. And the conceit of the, of the story was that, okay, there's this retirement home with all the old underground cartoonists. But behind it, over a little stream, a little bridge, are bungalows where all of the cartoon characters live. Of all the characters, of all the cartoonists, but I I, I just focus on mine. So there's Mr. Toad, has his own bungalow, all the characters from Young Lust, my character Shelf Life, all these characters that I've used over the years, they all have their little bungalow. And they all come to me and (laughs) kind of torment me by telling me who they are, that they're all aspects of me, and what exactly, what exact aspect they are of me. <laughs> um, it's a combination of you know, psychological insight and, and torture. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, that's where I kind of dealt with that most obviously. That To me, the Zippy and Griffey characters are both me. They're both parts of me. I'm neither all one or the other. I'm a lot closer to Griffey than Zippy. <laughs> otherwise, I couldn't drive a car or pay rent. Mm-hmm. But um, there's a Zippy in me, and there's a Griffey in me, and there's a dialogue going on between us. And that's where the comic strip, that's where the structure of the strip comes from. Okay, so what part is Shelf Life? Well, <laughs> he's the part of me that wants to make a quick buck. The huckster. Yeah, the huckster. Which I may have gotten from Larrier. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we're, we're making a discovery yes. here. Yes, or, and or a little bit my father. My father had never made a quick buck in his life, but he would love to have. And um, 
he's a little bit of my father. But yes, yeah, shelf life is a an aspect. He's not a big part of me, but he's an aspect. Um, in 1974, when underground comics were going through a really terrible um, economic downturn, it was when the Supreme Court had ruled that pornography was basically a matter of uh, community standards. So like a, a local district attorney in St. Louis, Missouri could bust an underground comic book, bookstore and um, have, have them be charged with pornography mm-hmm. and pandering to children because of course comic books are all for children. How could they not be for any, they can't be for adults, they must be for children even, even though it says adults only on the cover. This never got anywhere. Nobody got really terribly prosecuted. Um, but it, 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 there was a, a chill. And suddenly, all the head shops and underground comic bookstores, and they just returned underground comics in droves. It was like, we thought it was all over. So Art Spiegelman, myself, Willie Murphy, another underground cartoonist, and a few other people, Jay Lynch, we started something called the Cartoonist Co-op Press, which lasted about two years and produced... I think five comic books. We we thought we were gonna save comics from their economic turmoil and put it back in the hands of the cartoonists. And that that was shelf life. That was me being shelf life. <laughs> I remember I had I had a little desk in my apartment and I devoted it to the the, the business of end of the whole thing. And I like that. Um, we hired a guy to be our distributor, but we were we were we. It was really nothing I, I was suited for. And just like Shelf Life, he does these things and they backfire. So this backfired. Um, but even to this day, I have a website, zippythepinhead.com. Um, I sell books, I sell prints, I sell original art. That's Shelf Life. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now most people who are familiar with your work know you from Zippy. So they may know Zippy, but they may not know... They may, they may love Zippy. It may be one of their favorite strips. But they may not know that, you know, you, you have roots in the underground. Yes, there's a whole world of uh, younger people who have no idea that I did anything before the daily syndicated Zippy, which mm-hmm. started in 1986. And they're either um, amazed or befuddled or even repulsed. <laughs> By knowing that I did all this stuff, which, of course, was completely uncensored. Um, in Young Lust number seven, or maybe eight, the last issue of Young Lust, I don't know what came over me. I did, I, I just did a strip in which all of my characters have, have graphic sex. <laughs> and it was all, with Griffey all talking about it as if it was an, like a social experiment. And talking about what is pornography, what happens when you depict graphic sex, how do people react? But all the at the same time, graphic sex, sex is happening all over the story, everywhere, including Zippy and Zerbina having graphic sex. <laughs> Sometimes, when people who are only familiar with my daily strip see that, they have a hard time with it, <laughs> understandably. <laughs> so yeah, there's a there's both a connection between the underground me and the newspaper daily strip me and there's a separation too there's a there's a break both you know one of the things i've always been fascinated by is the fact that you know here we have this character you know i mean who's strange in a, multi, in a variety of different ways you know he has roots in the underground but even if you take the underground context out of zippy this this is this is a whacked out character, and then to have the Zippy strip carried by, yeah. of all places, King's features. I mean, right. you can't get any more mainstream than that. It just struck me as one of the greatest jokes in comics. That's, Did you feel that you know, way when? You know, Zip, some people tell me they think Zippy is surreal. I think it's much more surreal the way Zippy got onto the daily newspaper pages. So That's how did really that surreal. How did that happen? Okay, in 1985, I'm living in San Francisco. I'm doing Zippy at that point as a weekly, self-syndicating it to weekly alternative papers, about 50 papers, um, among other things. I'm doing other things too, but that, that's, that was Zippy. Um, 1985, 
San Francisco Examiner, which was the afternoon newspaper and therefore the, le- the less read, lower circulation newspaper, owned by the Hearst Corporation. Will Hearst III, who was maybe in his mid-30s, asked and was given the San Francisco, asked for and was given the examiner to edit, to manage, by his uncle, Randolph Hearst. One of the first things he did, after hiring a managing editor, was to contact Robert Crumb, me, and Hunter Thompson. He asked us all to do reg- a regular feature. He asked me to do a... I thought he was asking me to do a weekly, but he was asking me to do a daily. I didn't realize that. <laughs> he wanted me to do a... He wanted me to do a zippy strip for the examiner. He wanted Rock Crumb to do something, anything, <laughs> for him. And he wanted Hunter Thompson to do, I guess, to be realistic, it might have been a monthly or maybe every two weeks... A call. Okay. Crum was had no interest, but Aileen, his wife, Aileen Kaminsky Crum, the cartoonist, convinced Robert that they should give it a try. So they did twenty samples of a. I don't know if people are familiar with Robert and Aileen's comic Dirty Laundry. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you know it's the story of their relationship and stuff that happens. It's of course totally X-rated. So they did 20 very X-rated comic strips and handed them to Will Hurst, and he immediately said, I can't run this. And they said, and Robert said, yeah, that's right, good. So Robert sabotaged it. Yeah. So that was the end of that. Hunter Thompson did a few columns and then was just absurdly late on his deadline. You can imagine Hunter Thompson. And this was Hunter Thompson in 1985. You know, complete whack job. Um, I remember once Will flew Hunter Thompson into San Francisco, put him up at the Fairmont Hotel, and all for the purpose of giving him a good talking to. As if you could even talk to Hunter Thompson. (laughs) Hunter Thompson, you you want to talk about surreal. I interviewed him for The New Yorker once, in a comic form. The first thing he said to me was, Potatoes. And he just stared off in the distance. Potatoes. It's all about potatoes. <laughs> I mean, okay. Hunter Thompson is given a little reception at the hotel. That night, Will Hurst comes to the hotel room after the reception, during which, by the way, Hunter Thompson said he hated me. He hated Zippy, he thought it was stupid. Um, <laughs> He said, oh, you're the guy that does Zippy. Ugh, ugh, hate that stuff. Um, Will Hurst goes to meet with him that evening to have the little talk. He's met with gunshots through the door. Hunter Thompson actually shot through the door at Will, luckily missing him. That was the end of that relationship. <laughs> oh, God. But I kept going. I did it. So you were the one My of the deal, three. I that... was the sane one. My deal with them, though, was... When I discovered that they were asking for a daily and not a weekly, I was totally floored. I didn't know what to do about that. I said, okay, how about if you run a backlog of my weekly strips for six months to get me used to the rhythm of doing a daily? I'll work, work it up, but I, I, I can't just start off the bat. And they said, fine, no problem. So for six months, they ran a backlog of weekly zippies, much to the consternation of Randolph Hearst they put it on page two of the front section <laughs> huge um, ten inches wide you know, twice as wide as the way they are now the little postage stamp size that I'm reduced to now um, it had a big uh, logo at the top with a title and um, Will of course loved sticking it to his uncle <laughs> um, so that went on for a year then I get a call from a guy named Alan Prio, P R I L X, P R I L O U X, French name, not a French guy. He calls me from King Features, and he says, "Well, Bill, are you, you're aware, of course, that King Features is a Hearst uh, company, and, and you're working for a Hearst newspaper. Can I come to San Francisco and talk to you about 
taking Zippy nationally. And I said, what? <laughs> Doing what? And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could sell it to major city dailies now that it's been in the Examiner for six months. And I said, well, does that mean I get more money? And he said, yeah. I said... <laughs> there was shelf life. Yeah, there was shelf life. So I said, uh, okay. He comes out. We have a meeting. I remember bringing literally a little cheat sheet list of demands, thinking this will kill it. This will kill it. Because I just wanted to stay with the Examiner because it was working. I was on the verge of actually joining the newspaper union. I thought, wow, maybe I'll get, I'll get uh, like a medical plan out of this. That would be really weird. <laughs> Shelf life was really working. And every single thing I said, he agreed to, including a, a, a financial demand that I thought was insane. He just said, yeah, it's fine. That was it. I was stuck doing a daily strip. I mean, I, I had... I had used up my objections. He had cleared every one of them, said yes to every one of them. I mean, said no problem to every one of them. Um, I was aware that I couldn't, you know, inject, uh, you know, four-letter words and sex. I knew I couldn't do that. I already had gotten... I was okay with that already because working for the examiner. Yeah, you had gotten that out of your system. Anyway. I'd already gotten must... Yeah, I mean, that was my underground days. I got all that out, you know. Um, so I was, I was left with a, an offer. Uh, a few weeks later, he flew me to New York. And I was supposed to sit there in a room with all the King Future salesmen and tell them how to sell Zippy. I remember saying, well, just, um, just hope that the editor that you go into is my generation. And maybe they understand Zippy because they came out of my baby boomer generation and they said well that's not enough that's not going to help they're all older than that and I said well just tell them it's the weirdest comic strip in America <laughs> and they wrote it down carefully <laughs> weirdest comic strip in America there was only one of them who got what I was there's a guy named he's still there he's the west coast rep for King Futures named Richard Heimlich of the Heimlich Maneuver and so I always joke about that with him he, he got it completely and he wound up being the kind of spearhead and he sold it to a bunch of papers, and then he told the other salesmen how he did it, and they copied him. And suddenly I was in the Washington Post, and Houston Chronicle, and Detroit Free Press, and um, almost all, only big city papers. So in those initial days, once Zippy went with King Features, it was in these larger papers throughout the country. Uh, I mean, not only East Coast, West Coast, but even places like, you say, the Houston Chronicle. Yeah. Um, what was the reader reaction yeah. to Zippy? Well, it was it was uh, two classic reactions. One was, "Oh my God, I can't believe that stuff I read in underground comics is now in my daily newspaper. This is really weird and really great." <laughs> that I got a lot. And the other I got, and it was always letters to the editor, was total outrage. What is this drug-addled? When they made up whatever they wanted, I was uh, I was a a communist, I was a pornographer, I was <laughs> making fun of handicapped people, I was um, left-wing provocateur. I, uh, yes, a lot of... And papers eat that up. They love that stuff. They love it. There's nothing papers... Even to this day, in the, you know, the waning days of newspapers, they, they love any, any letters to the editor controversy. Do you continue to get letters to the editor? With Zippy? Nowhere near what I used to, but yeah. I just did last week to my... Uh, I live in Connecticut, and the Hartford Current is the big paper there, and Zippy's been in there forever. And I just did a strip a week or two ago in which I had... It's actually a strip based on a photograph taken by my great-grandfather in 1901 of Coney Island. And the reason I did this was because in that photograph, it's a big large, you know, all his photographs were all very big there, like 15 by 20. Um, a little figure in the far right, a pinheaded guy with a, a, a blousy kind of clown outfit with polka dots and white shoes. I said, oh my God, <laughs> Zippy. I mean, I just, I mean, it wasn't literally Zippy, but there, I don't know, a clown wandering the boardwalk of Coney Island for some purpose. That's what brought me to do this drawing. But in the middle of it were 
inexplicable other figures, two of whom were big head walk around, like the kind you see in Disneyland today. This is 1901. Big head Irish stereotype figures, mm -hmm. an Irish man and an Irish woman. In the early 1900s, the Irish were looked upon as subhuman by many people. Um, starting with the Irish potato famine when they all started coming over in the 1850s. And the, they were depicted as ape-like. They had simian features. I'm not even sure where this comes from exactly, <laughs> that Irish people look this way. But these were Irish stereotypes. So I make a note of it in my strip. I say, and notice the racist stereotype Irish big head figures. A whole bunch of people wrote to the Hartford Current and other papers saying I was a racist towards Irish people. For pointing out for pointing what was out, there in the photo. For pointing out that there was a racist manifestation of Irish racism in the photograph in 1901. <laughs> so reader comprehension is still a little difficult for some people. They see a buzzword and they... But who, of course, who would... If you're going to be a racist, you wouldn't use the word racist. I would... Right. That would be the well, last word you would, would use. One would think. That would be the last... So, yes, uh, that was a recent example of letters to the editor. And, of course, the editor of the Hartford Current wrote to me and said, would you care to respond? And I responded. I'm very cool-headedly, of course. I mean, I learned... Who is it? Where does this quote come from? I learned very early in my career as a semi-public figure, never complain, never explain. Do you, do you know where that comes from? I never... No. I should look it up someday. It does come from somebody. You know, it could be... Well, we know from Invisible Ink you're really good with Google. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, with, with Zippy, now that was an unintentional reaction that you produced. What is the furthest you've pushed the envelope since you've got, been King Features with Zippy? Oh, God. So many ways. <laughs> um, every once in a while, I'll do a strip and I'll think, I have an editor. You know, he doesn't edit me, but he's my editor at King Features. Um, he reads every strip of every cartoonist. And once in a while, I'll have a problem. But it's usually a problem in, you know, do you want to do this? Do you really want to do this? Because you might offend people in Kansas City. And I usually say, yes, I really want to do this. And so I say, okay, I just... Just wanted to find out. Really want to do it. I have been doing over the past few years, and I just did a bunch that are still about to come out of strips where I show God. Okay. God is depicted as a um, a face, an, a, an authority figure kind of a face that I got from a 1940s Life magazine aspirin ad <laughs> of a doctor saying, headache, take, and it's a brand of aspirin called Stand Back Aspirin, mm -hmm. which still exists. Yeah, it, yes. that, that's a southern thing. I remember. I grew, I grew up in North Carolina. Okay. I remember hearing Stand about Stand Back, Back all the time. Stand Back Company, they did aspirin, they did all kinds. They still exist. Snap Back with Stand Back. Exactly. Yes. And in the ads that they ran in the 40s and maybe into the 50s as a doctor figure. So I took that face, removed the the, the bottom, just the face. Oops. And um, it's my, I, I hardly ever do this. It's a paste up, it's a collage, in effect. And then I create the body. I make God appears as a, a male, a female, sometimes an animal. And this is my way of talking about religion. I am a non believer. Um, and my God strips are using God as, as just another cartoon character. I'm not denigrating the God figure. He's, he's just there. Mm -hmm. Zippy talks to him. Other people in my fictional town of Dingberg, where Zippy has lived for the past seven years, mm -hmm. they talk to him. Um, sometimes I talk to him. Sometimes he's um, judgmental. Sometimes he's insecure. He's just a character. <laughs> he's just another guy. He happens to be God. Um, I was expecting my editor at King Features to actually say, okay, Bill, that was it. You've now gone over the line. But he didn't. And he's been totally behind every one of those trips. 
not every reader is so happy with that. Especially, I, I actually get a lot of mail from Kentucky. Now, Kentucky is the Bible Belt, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get blaspheming messages from people. I guess I'm in a Kentucky. I don't even know what paper it's. I must be in, what's the big city in Kentucky? Louisville. And Lexi Lexington. Lexington. Lexington, yeah. But it must be in whatever. Kentucky must have one city that's a little more enlightened than the others. Probably I, I, Louisville. Louisville, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and uh, the Kansas City Star, I've gotten a bunch of letters saying I'm, uh, you know, sending me Bible tracts to read and, um, <laughs> you know, just some of them angry, some of them educational and sympathetic. And um, But when I did that, uh, you know, I, I didn't do it to be provocative. I just did it because I thought I, I felt like doing it. I always wanted to deal with religion directly. And not so much religion, it's just the whole idea of believing in a supernatural being, you know, just the whole idea. And I, I was a little worried when I did it that, that I would either get... I, was, I wasn't so worried about the reader reaction. I knew there would be both sides, people who would think it was funny and um, cool and whatever, and others who would be offended. But I was worried about King Features, and they never said a word. Um, the only time King Features has ever told me to not, literally, not run that strip... Um, Years and years ago, McDonald's was kind of forced into listing the ingredients in their all their um, products, and to kind of overcompensate for it, they put the list on the walls of McDonald's. It was taken down very quickly, mm -hmm. and so I had a strip where Zippy walks into a McDonald's. And he doesn't really order from the menu. He orders from the ingredient list. <laughs> he describes all the He wants all those ingredients. So, you know, 20% tallow fat, 5% fish powder. He, he, that's what he wants. My editor at King Features this weekend. And, uh, um, McDonald's is just going to be on top of us. So the two things, that and Disney. Oh. That and Disney. Um, I've, I've managed to make jokes about Disney and get away with some of it but Disney's very litigious so is McDonald's and they know they're not they know they're not going to win they just they, they'll beat you over the head they'll beat you over the head with with um, lawyers letters depositions and King Features is not going to um go through that for me. Well, don't you write also in that top 40 list that Disney is great Disney to make is, fun of? Disney is great dot 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 to make fun of. Superheroes <laughs> are great dot 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 to make fun of. Manga is great dot 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 to make fun of. Um, I teach comics, like I said, at School of Visual Arts once a week in New York and at the beginning of each semester I hand that list out just so they know what they're getting. Because <laughs> I'm sure that there's some artists there who are very much influenced oh, by yeah. manga. Well, less and less, thank God. Mm. But I, last year and this year, I, right away, there's this one girl, she's an Asian, I think she's Chinese, she's a fairly thick Chinese accent, but um, nice person, and she, I saw her first work. She could get a job doing manga next week. She's really good. So, do I say, don't do that? No. My, my job as a teacher is to be the encourager not the discourager. So I am I always sort of wince inside when I see someone doing manga, and I try to direct them to do more interesting manga, add some humor in there somewhere, and not take it so seriously. But when all they're doing is regurgitating what they've seen before, it's, it takes every ounce of my griffiness <laughs> to, to, or whatever my... To repress that desire to say, get out of here. You can't do that. So what is this course that you, that you teach? What is well, the name of it is Storytelling, not my name. I didn't give it that <laughs> name. I'm going to try to get the name changed. But it's about narrative. It's about writing comics. Okay. It's, um, I mean, it's about doing comics, but it's, it's focused more on 
on the writing um, and continuity and all the issues that come up. Kids that go to School of Visual Arts, they're all, they're all fairly talented. They didn't get there by being untalented. Um, but they all have a lot to learn about writing. Do you find it a little ironic that you, the creator of Zippy, who is the master of the non sequitur, you're teaching a class on storytelling? <laughs> well, you know, um, <laughs> that brings up a whole other thing. Um, when people tell me, Zippy does speak in non sequiturs, but the non sequiturs make sense on their own. And they play off usually another character's dialogue. So it, there's, Zippy isn't just spouting six sentences that don't relate to each other. He's talking to somebody, and what they say makes him spout that non sequitur. So there's a direct relation between what someone has just said to Zippy, or what he's seen or read or whatever, what he's been exposed to, and what comes out of his mouth. It's not, it's not pure non sequitur. And when people say Zippy is surreal, what that means to me is they don't get it. Mm-hmm. Zippy's not surreal. He wants surreal? Listen to Bob Dylan's lyrics. <laughs> he wants surreal? I mean, listen to half the pop songs and rock lyrics that you've ever heard. Listen, read them completely. Nirvana. Read the lyrics of Nirvana's album as, as writing. It's random imagery. I'm sure it made sense to them when they were doing it, and a lot of their audience probably grasps some images and gets into it, but as writing, it's completely surreal. To me, mm-hmm. <laughs> Zippy's not surreal. Zippy is just, he's off-center. He's, um, he's kind of rearranging reality in his head and spouting it out again. He's, he's making his own weird kind of sense while doing that. And when you get on Zippy's wavelength, you see that. If you just see it as crazy talk, I mean, I, what can I say? I can't imagine you keep reading it very long. <laughs> if you saw it as nothing but crazy talk. I remember um, when I first started doing Zippy, he was much crazier. From like 1970 to about 1974. 1974, Art Spiegelman, who was still living in San Francisco, and I were very close friends. And Art said to me one time, it was this was a very this really shook me up. He said, "No, I really like Zippy. What you've done with it, but there was a but, you know. Oh God, what is he going to say? But you know, it's kind of like being stuck in an elevator with a crazy person, and you you're looking at the floor numbers. You're waiting for your floor so the door will open and you can get out. And that sunk in." I, I never, you know, I, that was a very astute remark of his. And I thought to myself, okay, how can I keep doing Zippy, um, have him go through some sort of creative growth where he isn't just being this loose cannon who says crazy stuff and does crazy stuff? I said, well, how about if I have a sidekick? another character and my first idea was Mr. Toad (laughs) Um, but that didn't work because Mr. Toad completely took over very quickly Zippy was subdued by Mr. Toad okay that doesn't work what if I make I had done the Griffey character a little bit but not in a Zippy strip so I said well okay wait a minute if Zippy is me me the you know the kind of zen surrealist wherever he is then who's different from him? Who could be his opposite in a kind of, um, you know, comedy team, you know, Abbott and Costello, whatever sense, but somebody for him to to bounce off of. And I said, well, maybe Griffey. And wait, that's me. Now I'm putting myself in this trip. That seems like it has a lot of possibilities. Mm-hmm. And I did. And had I not done that, I don't think Zippy would have continued because the craziness of Zippy would have worn thin with me too, just as it had. In fact, Art Spiegelman was saying that. It's wearing thin, Bill. Mm -hmm. Um, Had I not done that, I probably wouldn't have kept it up. And then every so often during the time I've been doing the Daily Strip, I do kind of retool the strip. I don't do it consciously, but 
1998, I moved from San Francisco to Connecticut, okay? I'm suddenly in a completely new world, new environment. I become very tuned into where I am. I notice these roadside things, these muffler men. Diners all over the place. New England is full of diners. I started thinking, wow, I'm going to incorporate this world that I'm now in into the Zippy strip. So Zippy began to exist as this guy that hung out in diners and talked to people. And then he started talking to giant bowling pins and giant ducks and all these real things that were around me on my driving around New England, Long Island. The strip was literally retooled as a result. And another retooling was from several years ago when you started to write a lot about Dingbird. Dingbird was 2007. So Dingbird happened. These things happen organically, but thank goodness they happen. Mm -hmm. Just before the Dingbird strip started, I'm doing Zippy, and unexpectedly, um, he's talking to other pinheads that look like him, (laughs) that wear his clothing, that have different faces and... Some are female, some are male, some are fat, some are bearded. They're, they all look like different. And it, it began to interest me. So I was doing about two weeks' worth of that. And then I thought, wait a minute, what am I doing? Where do these characters come from? They must live somewhere. Aha. <laughs> so I created the town of Dingberg with an obvious nod to Duckburg mm-hmm. from uh, Donald, Donald Duck Scrooge Comics which were my favorite comics as a kid. And I'm still doing Dingberg. And I'm kind of waiting for the next retooling. So we're still in the Dingberg phase. You're at the end of the Dingberg phase. At the end of the Dingberg phase. I can feel it fading. (laughs) So I don't know what's going to happen next. But something will. Now where exactly did did Zippy come from? So, you know, you you said that he is in many ways you or a certain side of you. But what was the spark? Well, there are two two sparks. um, But... the, the practical, real, real-world answer is: um, in 1970, I was asked by another a fellow underground cartoonist by the name of Roger Brand to do a story for his comic called Real Pulp Comics. There were two issues of it. This was for Real Pulp Comics number one. So I said, "Okay, I'll do something." Do you have any? thoughts, you know, any guidelines, what what do you want? He said, why don't you do a love triangle and make one of the characters really weird, just (laughs) just bizarre. So, okay, that's good, I like that idea. I was friends with another underground cartoonist, who, both of these guys are dead, by the way, called Jim Osborne. Jim Osborne had a, um, almost an unhealthy interest in the macabre. He had, among, among other, other things in his apartment, he had a collection of Sideshow Freak postcards that were sold by Sideshow Freaks to customers in the Sideshow, usually. But you could also buy them by just ordering them from where the Sideshow Freaks wintered, which was in a town called Gibsonton, Florida, which is still around and still has aging Sideshow Freaks living in it. And I went there several times, (laughs) interviewed them. Um, So I'm looking through his collection of freak photos, basically, and I come across the pinhead that I remember having seen in Todd Browning's 1932 movie Freaks. I said, is that the same guy? And Jim said, yeah, it's the same guy. I said, can I borrow this? (laughs) And I did a zippy strip called I Fell for a Pinhead, and he made a fool out of me. And it was kind of a young, lusty story with two so-called normal people and a pinhead. And it's like a, a three-way love triangle. That's the birth of Zippy, mm-hmm. that strip. I thought it was a one-shot thing. I had no intention of ever doing any more. And look where you are. Look where I am. So there you go. Now, getting back to Invisible Ink... It- I was wondering when I picked it up how much you would resist the temptation to bring Zippy into this memoir, this very personal story of yours. <laughs> he he does make a few appearances. Yeah. 
And, and I'm wondering, was was that difficult for you to separate your the, zippy I, creative life from I, this? Yeah. The only way that I felt I could bring Zippy into this book was by relating him, connecting him to to the subject of the book. That I couldn't just bring him in randomly or somehow switch gears and suddenly have Zippy appear. That the way I bring him in is I, I, I wonder what would have happened to Zippy um, if... Well, if Larrier had been my mentor, and what would Zippy look like? And would I have done what Larrier did, which was, if a strip doesn't work, just go back and try it again. Keep aiming for the, the commercial um, appeal. Larrier's, Larrier's motto was, um, go, for the, go for the money. Don't worry about how, what people think of you as an artist. If, you, if it sells, that, that validates everything. Which my mother adopted, too. She would say that to me. She would say... I would say sometimes... I was aware that she was selling articles here and there. She had, she had a, a, a modest success as a writer. And I'd say, Mom, you did... Last week you did something for Cat Fancy magazine. And the next week you did something for the Cowboy Hall of Fame magazine. There doesn't seem to be much connection between the two... And she said, the connection is they both accepted my work and paid me. <laughs> anyway, um, so Zippy enters my book only in the sense that I wonder um, if I had done Zippy as a daily strip with Larrier as my kind of artistic father, um, what would it have looked like? So I have four different examples of what it would have looked like. And... Larry was a guy that just tried everything, just looking for the thing that clicked. But he did four daily strips over his career. And each time there was... Um, the, the, the impulse behind it was to make, make a buck, which, of course, that's not how, that's not how things happen. Yeah. I mean, daily comic strips, you know, he admired Milton Kniff. He thought Milton Kniff was... Milton Kniff didn't sit down and think, how can I make a buck out of comic strips? <laughs> Milton Kniff was an artist... He was, he was an artist the same way anybody else is an artist. And Larry never quite, he never got there. Now, you said at the, the beginning of our interview uh, for our listeners that this is the first time that you do a long-form comic. Now that Invisible Ink is out, do you have any plans or do, do you have the, uh, the, the bug now to create another long-form work? Not only do I have the bug, I'm 25 pages into it. Uh, anything you can tell? Well, it's about? called it's 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 the it's called Nobody's Fool: The Life and Times of Schlitzy the Pinhead. Schlitzy. Schlitzy. That was the name of the pinhead who was in Freaks. He has no. There's no birth name. Nobody knows what his birth name is. I have been researching the hell out of that, and I'm doing a long biography slash impression of Schlitzy. I came across two people, I think they're the only two people that exist, who were close enough to him to tell me personal stories about him. Schlitzy lived from 1901 to 1971. He worked for sideshows from the early 1920s until just a year before he died. He was the among the top ten sideshow attractions all that time. He worked for dozens of different circuses and managers and promoters. His default personality was happy. He was very happy. Um, I, 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 th- his last um, manager was a man named Ward Hall, who lives in Gibsonton, Florida. He was a man in his late 80s. I had a long interview with him, several interviews, so I got a lot of information. The best thing of all, though, uh, I met a guy who lives very near me in Connecticut who spent an entire summer with Schlitzie in 1965 in Toronto for a circus. And he has given me the, the big treasure trove of anecdotes that make Schlitzie a human being, not a circus freak. Um, so I'm trying to humanize who he was. 
So you're writing, uh, th this will be a graphic biography. A graphic biography, yes, but it's with certain fictional qualities because I'm imagining, based on what I've been told and what I've read, I'm imagining a lot of what his life would have been like. But I've been told so many great... You know, what, what makes any story come alive is detail. Mm -hmm. Specif specificity, not generality, right? So everybody knows... Schlitzie the Pinhead was a sideshow freak and he was really weird and yada yada. But to know that when he was in a car sitting with somebody and he heard music on the radio, he rocked back and forth and said, You see? You see? You see? That's an insight into a human being. Yes, a mentally challenged person. But there's a person, a real person in there. I found out that he spoke clearly to these people. In the movie Freaks, you just you can't understand what he's saying. It's just sort of garbled. He spoke clearly when he felt like it. He was tortured many times by people in the audience. Um, I asked this friend, this guy that knew him, I said, what happened when people would scream, you know, epithets? Because that's what they did. This, and sideshows, part of the reason you go to a sideshow is to f torment the person or laugh at them or whatever, or just be in general to think of them as these not quite human people so he said, well, you know, the, what happened was in almost every performance after Schlitzie was introduced as being the missing link and the wild Australian child and all this fanciful um bios that had no basis in reality he would, he would play a little ukulele which he couldn't really play and he would do a card trick which he couldn't really do and people would start yelling and very often boys or young men would throw lit cigarettes at him I said wow that sounds really bad what happened? and he said well Schlitzie would be um, afraid at first and, you know, react like anybody would but after a minute of it, if it, was, if it didn't stop, he would walk to the edge of the stage. This is a man when he was in his 60s. Walk to the edge of the stage, crouch over the stage, and with this guy described as an animal rage on his face, he would stare at the people that were torturing him until he freaked them out. <laughs> I, I thought of calling my book Freaked Out, but I can't do that. Yeah. He would freak them out with his freakishness, and they would run away. Wow. They would be completely... That he wouldn't know what to do. He also, if he saw women together, he would be immediately attracted to them, and he would hang over the edge of the stage, and he would ask them how their day was. And they would say something, because they were just being nice, and then he would launch into a whole thing about his day. And all this, I've recorded all this, and so I have this huge amount of information that, to me, makes him come to life. And I'm just going to... It, it starts off with me seeing the movie Freaks in 1962. Um, and at that time, I was in art school. I was going to Pratt. I was very moved by that movie. I knew there was something really big inside that Pinhead character. But I was not a cartoonist, so I, I didn't know what to do with it. I did paintings. I did drawings. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I needed to be a cartoonist. Will you yourself, not Griffey, will you be a figure in this new work in, in ways that you are in Invisible Ink as the storyteller? Yes. Because part of the detail you were talking about in terms of the humanizing factor that, that really comes out in Invisible Ink is the fact that you as not only the son, but... <clears throat> The storyteller, you're such a central part of that, and, and that allows you to manipulate the time shifts that go back and forth right. in quite a complex way. Yeah. Where you do something similar yes. with the new book. Yes, I already am. Yes, okay. I'm. I'm important. I'm important as a character, and I'm doing time shifting as well. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I, that's the kind of story I like. I like. I don't like stories that are just one straight line from A to B. I like to go from A to X to Q to back to A and then to Z. It's a tricky way to write a story, but um, it's kind of the way stories happen. Stories don't happen necessarily in a completely linear fashion. They're 
interrupted. They're fleshed out at different points. They trigger thoughts and make you go in other directions. The trick is to keep it cohesive. That's the trick. That, for that, I, th- I have to thank my wife a lot. For as, when I was doing Invisible Ink, for her telling me where that didn't work, mm-hmm. and I had to fix it. Yeah, and it's also the way that we, as readers, interpret narrative. I mean, we don't do it in a linear fashion. No. We go back and forth, and we're reminded of things, and there are associations exactly. that we right, make. right. So it's very fluid. Yeah, I, I am. Um, I think it's, for me, it's kind of a natural way to work. Yeah. So, we'll continue to have the strips of Zippy. We have the new book that just come out, and then this other one that you're working on, The Long Form. So, we're going to continue to get a lot of Bill Griffin. Yes, you will. And how I can keep doing a daily strip and teach once a week, um, don't ask. (laughs) Well, good luck keeping up that stamina, and I want to thank you very much for talking with me on the Comics Alternative. You're very welcome. And there you have it, my conversation with Bill Griffith on the release of his new book, Invisible Ink, My Mother's Secret Love Affair with a Famous Cartoonist. I want to thank Bill again for taking the time and being on the podcast. I also want to thank Jack Cohen at Fantagraphics for helping to set up this interview. I couldn't have done it without you, Jack. Thanks a lot. And if you want to find out what all the hubbub is about concerning Bill Griffith, then go to the website of our sponsor, dcbservice.com. If you type in the search Bill Griffith, you'll find a variety of his books at 35% off of the cover price, including Bill Griffith's Lost and Found, 1970 through 1994. Zippy Dingberg Diaries, Welcome to Dingberg, and Ding Dong Daddy, another Zippy collection. You just can't get enough of Zippy if you go to Discount Comic Book Service. And I'm pretty sure that soon you'll be able to find Bill's latest book, Invisible Ink, at a really good discount at DCB Service's sister site, and that's In Stock Trades. So whether it's DCB Service or In Stock Trades, you can't go wrong with those guys. They'll do you right when it comes to your comics. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with me and let me know what you think about Bill's comics. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll see in the right-hand side of your browser a tab that says Send Voicemail. Click on that, and from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile device, you can send us a voicemail through the wonders of SpeakPipe. It's very simple and easy to use. Or, if you want to be a little more difficult about it, you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 415 415- Three comics. That's four one five three two six six four two seven. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, and you can contact me directly at Derek at alternativecomics.com. We also have a Twitter account. We're at the number two guys with PhDs. And thank you, everyone, over this past weekend at SPX for retweeting our tweets. You can find us as well on Facebook, on Tumblr on Instagram, on Google+, and on Pinterest. And if you like to consume your media through YouTube, we even have a YouTube channel, so you can check out the show that way. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. And you can find, as always, every single one of our episodes, as well as our reviews and our various comics-related commentary that we put up on the blog. And that's at the website, Comics Alternative. There are a lot of ways of getting in touch with us, and we do like to hear from you. And I would especially like to hear what you think about the interview with Bill Griffith. And if you've read Invisible Ink, well, get in touch with me and let me know what you think about that as well. And until the next interview show, take care. from feet to hair. They look at your geranium as if they were geranium. Hey, I dress as good as Fred Astaire. 
Is my nose job all right? Is my bow on too tight? I feel like a bark but tear. So I take off my shoe and I stare at them too. Pinheads are everywhere. Grab the bus to ancient Rome. They all know this kid's tapered dome. Scouts playing Scrabble beneath the Tower of Babel. So me, their metronome. Should I pull up my gown? Am I still in Levittown? How much is the subway fare? What's so weird about me? Take a look at Johnny T. Pinheads are everywhere. Junior Mints. Took the Mustangs and left the wash on and rinse. I took off my fedora and filled it with Cremora. Three bus boys yell. I should have used the Mints. Are my thoughts on okay? Uh-oh, should I wear a toupee? Is it fun to play solitaire? You come from Peru. So we yell at you too. Pinheads are everywhere. Just a modern guy. He's a surfer from Uptown Tampai. I like to pay my taxes and listen to the saxes. <laughs> Woo, give me some cool whip. Oh, two points on the red guy. Yow, it's time to go bowl. Am I out on parole? Oh, Snippy, you're so dead. What's Spinoza say to Freud? Life is a cockasoid. Pinheads are everywhere. <laughs> Principal's office today. You have a fast set for me. Hello? Hello, pal. Could you come over and give me a sensitive portrayal of a victimized middle class homeowner? Yow! I am having fun! Hmm. I wonder if it's net fun or gross fun. The printing on my scallop is of a consistent thickness, but I want another rewrite on my Caesar salad. If room service doesn't come soon, I'm going to leave my body. I'm wearing pampers. When you begin to feel shooting pains in your stomach, do two deep breaths. 
Three bands and half desserts. Well, here I am in America. I like it. I hate it. I like it. I hate it. Emotions are sweeping over me. I'm taking a meeting. When do I go into profits? Where's my eviction notice? We're all over 30. Let's talk about real estate. 